book now um on our i think it was our second day maybe third after we got a little sleep i don't know those days those early days all rain together you ask our tour guide if he knew any vietnamese veterans and sure enough he got you in touch with a Viet Cong veteran and i remember north north uh, vietnamese no oh okay north vietnamese okay and I remember the two of you left on his scooter to go interview him. So tell me about that experience. I know you had some great stories about meeting him. And how did he make his way into the book? Okay. Well, um, I'm not sure he really is in the book. Okay. Sure. I'm, I'm trying to remember. Do you remember? Did I put anyway? It was an amazing. He was a former North Vietnamese colonel in the North Vietnamese Army. And we had to go, we had to go through these winding corridors in the middle of Hanoi, downtown Hanoi, with, with streets with alleys. They were basically alleys that were only about three feet wide. And there were chickens running down the, uh, the alleys and cats and, and, and women, when they were a little wider, were sitting there with their pho on their, on their little um, stove top mm -hmm. or, or heaters, what do you call hot plates. And it was, and the smells were not, oh. the and we kept winding around and going left and right and right and left and left. And finally got to his house, which really opened up into an alley. That's all it was. We walked in and there he was standing military straight in his uniform that he had worn 50 years before. And it was still fit him. And when, when I looked up at the top of the wall of his living, of his parlor, there were two pictures. And one was of Ho Chi Minh and the other was of Karl Marx. And the amazing thing was that he was still a committed communist, just like Ho Chi Minh. This man, this former colonel was still a communist and was still very much um, committed to, to the party. And he'd been a party member and that was the only way he could have, he taught, I think he taught propaganda is what I think he did, nice. but talked a long time. And I, and I asked him the kinds of questions that I wanted to know. Um, and I had to work through the, our, our guide who was the interpreter. And when I got home, I, you know, the interpreter was telling me things that I wrote down and they weren't really that surprising. And when I got home, I got the um, transcript. I got a transcript made of it because I knew I might want to use some of what he said in, in the book. And the woman who did the translation emailed me. He said, she said, you know, there's something weird about this transcript. His answers are not what your guide said. What he said and what your guide said are very different. And I said, really? So I, I asked her to include both of them. And um, he was, you know, the, the man, he was, the, the colonel was um, long-winded and um, was kind of advocating some communist, you know, um, communist ideals and communist ways of doing things. And my guide was sort of trying to tamp it all down and say, well, it's, you know, it was a long time ago. He did tell me, I, I did ask him about female fighters. And he did tell me about the long haired army, which was what, what was the generic term of what they called the women fighters. And then when we went to the prison and we mm -hmm. saw all those pictures of female fighters who had been imprisoned and um I, I it wasn't in hanoi i think it was outside no, it was outside ho chi minh city yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Ho Chi Minh city. um you know i really saw a lot of female uh warriors on on the side of uh the Viet Cong. so he did tell me about that and i i that becomes a, a major focus of the book so we should say the plot line of the book is two sisters who um whose village is bombed by the american army 
they happen to be burned to the ground. Basically. Burned to the ground. Remin um, they, reminiscent of um, um, William, you know, Lieutenant Callie and the um, the events of the s mid '60s. I forget when it was when he basically did that to okay. a Vietnam village, and he got hauled into court and court martialed for it. Um, these two happen to be at the river, the bend in the river, doing laundry, and so they're the only two survivors of their village. Um, and so one of the si one of the sisters goes to Saigon at the time, and they both go. Yes. They both go to Saigon. One of them stays there basically and becomes a dancer, waitress, various other things. Bar girl in Saigon. Bar girl. And the other sister goes and fights for the North Vietnamese. So um, that's the premise of, of the book. And I thought um, there the uh, May who goes to Saigon. Saigon. Um, and Tam goes to fight. And Tam had a, um, I should have looked this up, but there was a man that she would go to for jobs for to to do the training and um a Viet, a, a, a Viet Cong training camp right that, that for two weeks and that's all that the Viet Cong could afford um in terms of training they really should have been trained for you know eight weeks before they were sent out but they they got two weeks and and during those two weeks it was a mix of skills that they would need in the field, um, as well as uh, education, political education. Okay. okay. Uh, most of the training was guerrilla fighting. They, the, the Viet Cong, which were the South Vietnamese communists, knew that they weren't going to win the war by um, any kind of attacks. So they very much, they very much learned guerrilla techniques and snares and booby traps and things that would uh, keep the U.S. soldiers uh, from doing what they did to the village uh, on other villages. Okay. Um, so one of my favorite days was the day we visited the Coochie Tunnels, uh, and that was outside of uh, uh, Ho Chi Minh City as well. It may have even been the same day as the um, prison, I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. um, I actually got a little lost that day. <laughs> mm -hmm. I got a little bored with where we were, so I started to explore a tunnel on my own and got turned around. So that was interesting. But these tunnels were fascinating. We were, we were both fascinated by them. They were three stories, three different levels. Um, they had dormitories, they had kitchens, they had meeting rooms where big offensive plans were, um, were set and, and the generals met with their, with their soldiers. Um, you they, used a lot of, go yeah, ahead. They said that um, Tet, right. the Battle of Tet was planned inside the Coochie Tunnels. Right. And we were in there, that was the room that I got lost in. Um, but it was, I don't think you were there with me in that room. I know it was a little claustrophobic, but it was a, what you would consider the size of a, a boardroom. Um, there was no table in it at the time when we were there, but there was a table. They had some mannequins set up to show where people stood. And there was a, a board, a chalkboard at the front of the room where they actually, you know, did the plans. Um, you use the tunnels a lot in the book. I know that was an, uh, a special day for you, too. Um, I imagine you had too much to work with, especially with all the, the booby traps like we talked about. How did you narrow down to incorporate what you did in the, in the novel? Well, I knew that um, it was going to be a, the major part of Tum, that's how you, Dum is how you pronounce it in Vietnamese, that's Tam, of her... Um, oh, okay fighting days. Um, and I also did a lot of research when I got home as to how the tunnels were used. And not only was it a depository for arms, but it was, um, there were some really ingenious things they did when they constructed it. Like they had vents for steam 
that would come out of the kitchen and would cycle in fresh air, theoretically. Um, there was a hospital. There were supply rooms. Um, there was, uh, by the way, Kuchi is named for a tree, which ironically is poisonous. It can kill you if you oh. tap and you mix it with a drink, you can kill someone with it. Anyway, and <laughs> were so the North Vietnamese soldiers would come down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which connected to the Kuchi tunnels at one point. Then they'd go through the tunnels and emerge basically just outside Saigon. And so then sometimes they would, they would take the wounded back up through the Kuchi tunnels and then up through the Ho Chi Minh Trail to go home if they were still, still alive. Okay. There were some Americans who liked to go into the tunnels and see what they could kill uh, in the way of North Vietnamese or Viet Cong uh, fighters. And they were called tunnel rats. And so I knew that there was going to be an experience with a tunnel rat but I had to figure out what was going to lead up to it. And um, you'll, you'll read about, people can read about that in the book. But there comes a moment where Tom um, really wants revenge for something that happened to her in the tunnels. And um, a, she's convinced that a tunnel rat was responsible for what happened. And she goes after him and she nearly gets killed, but she does kill the tunnel rat. Mm -hmm. And there were, you know, one of the things that we, we heard about in the Kuchi tunnels was that the Vietnamese, uh, they were, they had German, she the Americans had German she shepherds who would come on top of the tunnels and sniff. And when they sniffed a Vietnamese or a foreign scent, they would let their masters know and they, the tunnel rats would know there was some Vietnamese people passing through underneath. And so it turned out that the Vietnamese were told that they had to bathe with American soap so that the German shepherds would not think they were a foreign yeah. soap of anything. And so the Vietnamese people ended, or the fighters that went through the Gucci tunnels did start bathing when they did, when they could with American soap. Mm -hmm. um, there were, in, in the, the three stories of the tunnels, when you went from one level to another, there was always a trap or a snare or a booby trap of some sort. And when we got out of the tunnels, they told us, they showed us some of those traps. And of course, I was very interested in those. There were um, basically, uh, it could have been made, you know, there were bamboo spikes that were mm -hmm. sharp edge. There were metal spikes that were also honed to a really sharp edge. And most of the tap traps had to do with fooling the soldiers so they'd fall into a hole and hopefully get wounded by the spikes inside the hole. There was all sorts of permutations of those though. There was at least five different kinds of mm -hmm. traps. Fish traps, there were um, a door trap, there was um, a, a rolling trap that they called it. There were snares with trip wires. Um, and of course, there were tons and tons of landmines. In fact, the North Vietnamese repurposed landmines. They would go, when there was a battle that they knew about that was over, they'd go searching for landmines and be very, very careful that they didn't step on them. And they would take them very carefully and put them back into their trucks or cushion them so they wouldn't, uh, wouldn't go off but they could strip those landmines down and get um, ammunition and get, uh, or actually reuse them in other places if they wanted to. So landmines, and there were spider holes for the, for the enemy to lie in wait, kind of like the trenches of World War I, you know, they would lie in a, in a spider hole covered up, their heads would be covered up with, with leaves and foliage and grass, and then when the uh, enemy came, they would jump out and attack them. So there were bamboo sticks that were laced with poison. There was all sorts of interesting things. So some of that made its way uh, mm -hmm. in, into the book. It really was amazing. I remember the, um, the vent from the one kitchen we saw, they actually fed it yards away so that if the Americans were flying over with um, 
heat detection machines. They wouldn't actually see the kitchen and um, their shoes were all made from the rubber of the abandoned Jeeps, the American Jeeps. Um, really was so much more practical than the, than the American soldiers having to plod along through the marshes and the rice paddies and get their feet all uh, grunged up with their socks getting wet and then their shoes getting wet and then um, having, having foot rot. And, they, and the Vietnamese were darting around the jungle in their rubber sandals and uh, they had the advantage.